It's such a wonderful opportunity for me to be here. Um, for all the Afrikaans sprekende mense, ek is eindelijk Afrikaans. <laughs> I heard we have some English friends here. Can I just see by hands who's the English speaking people here? <laughs> okay, well then, that's the English row. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do this in the, in the book of Acts. Um, while they were speaking in tongues, some of the people heard it the, in their own intellect. Okay, so I'm going to preach in Afrikaans the whole evening, like I'm doing right now. This is actually just part of the gifting. So while I'm sharing in Afrikaans, you're, you're, are you getting it in English? Okay, that's just part of how awesome God is. So let's just give the Lord a hand. Um, um, oh, th- th- first of all, thanks, thanks to all the leadership. Can I just quickly see who the leadership is in here? Uh, I know I'm acquainted with some of you guys. Um, is it right? Please just raise the hands if you lead us in the house. Um, guys, uh, we just want to be thankful towards the leadership in this house and everything that you guys have done for us over the um, past few years. Um, myself and my family has, uh, have a huge appreciation for anyone who was involved in a time of our life which was um, basically one of the worst times. Um, they say friends aren't, you, do, you don't get to, to make friends and no friends in good times. But in very bad times, you really see who your friends are. And we, have, we were very fortunate that we, we had the perfect um, problem and God was so gracious towards us that we could experience his goodness and his kindness in such a measure that we can stand here today and say that, that he's really the God that still raises the dead. And um, today as I'm standing here, I'm not here as anything else. Um, I'm, I'm not here. The word says that you won't call me servants. I, I've heard many people in pre- on the pulpit saying they're in service of the Lord or they're the Lord's servant. I'm not the Lord's servant. I'm his son. Um, I think that there's John 15. He makes a statement and he says that um, servants won't know everything. And God won't reveal everything to the servants, but he will, he will reveal it to the sons. And I've got a desire just here where I am today. I, I don't believe I have any special gifting. Um, I'm going to speak about it today about my extended family. Oh, Linda and Eddie, who's, who's part of, still part of our family, they, they're just living in Azerfontein. <laughs> and um, uh, can I quickly pray? And I think that I'm going to open. Oh, is that fine? But we don't have a band or anything that else that needs to happen. Let's just close our eyes. Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity just to be here and to glorify your name. Your word says, Lord, where two or more gather in your name, there you are in our midst. Father, we are so blessed by the idea that you are with us. How lovely is it, Lord, where we dwell together and you can be with us. Knowing, Lord, that you are for us, not against us. Knowing that you have changed everything. Knowing the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And Lord, that we never ever need to feel insecure with our time on, in this world because we've come to know the one who has chosen us and called us by our names. We bless you, Holy Father. We bless your name. And we say thank you, Lord, that we can be part of this ecclesia in coming together and raising the name of all names. Amen. 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 Um, so for myself, it's a, it's a huge opportunity just to be in Azerfontein, Cape Town. <laughs> it's lucky to, 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 to be in this side of the world. Um, every time we come down here, we always think you guys are so blessed and fortunate. Uh, I will always be a blue bull, Eddie. I don't know if you've converted. <laughs> okay, so that's the downfall. That's, that's going to be maybe the worst part of this whole th- evening that you're going to have to st- be stuck up. <laughs> but while I've got the mic, that's fine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Um, tomorrow, I'm spend, not, not tomorrow, on Friday, I'm spending time with Adrian Peter Show, who's the, he, he, he's the number one s- Stormers reporter. And I think it's going to be a bit of a rub, rub off, because I'm not necessarily the number one. Um, he says 100% Stormer, 200% Jesus. I guess so I said to him, listen, yeah, I don't know about that, but I, I know I can go with the 200% Jesus, but I'm not so sure about this 100% Stormer thing. <laughs> so we're gonna, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time around Stormers in these next few days. And let's see um, if the Lord's still doing a miracle in Cape Town. Maybe people will still convert. Amen. <laughs> so, um, but while, while we're at that, um, I remember going into ministry. I went to ministry. I was, let, let me give you a small testimony of just where I come from. I, I come out of a background where um, I come out of a dysfunctional household, where my parents got divorced at a very young age. 
unfortunately that left room for a lot of things that went wrong in my life. I was molested, I think, at the age of three, four, by a few family members, and then it went over to uh, other type of mol mol molestings that took place at the age of seven, eight, which was one of the guys was even the, the head boy of a, of a primary school. And um, it ended, I ended up in a place where I was broken, hurtful, angry at life, and I had a, um, I started using drugs at the age of maybe, I think 11 was my first encounter with drugs. Started selling at the age of 12, 13 for the Max Gang. I don't know if the Max is a big in, in Cape Town. And um, got into a, a lot of uh, ruffles at a very young age. And basically, um, at the age of 19, I had my first encounter with the Holy Spirit and I gave my heart to Jesus and what an amazing, I had the greatest fix and the greatest experience and all of a sudden I had prophets coming out and saying to me, you're going to be a leader of leaders. I thought to myself, I don't want to be the guy that busts people when they smoke at, at break time. <laughs> you know, to me, a leader was a foreign idea. It wasn't something that was close to me. And um, so basically in the next year, um, in the first six months of my new journey with the Lord, I had this very, very awesome encounter with God and I totally backslided. Is there anyone who can relate to that? Is there anyone who's gone off that road? A bit? And I thought to myself, um, yes, okay, Lord, this is, this is very odd. And for the next six, seven months, I stuffed up things even worse than you can think. And I gave, made a recommitment. When I, the, the year I, when I was 20, the year I was turning 21, I made a recommitment with the Lord and I was about to go to prison. I severely um, uh, beat a guy one night after uh, 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 I was bouncing at Jacqueline's. You can remember Jacqueline's is the only open to honors. Okay, so I was bouncing there and I got into a, a, a rumble with a guy and I, my friends followed the guy back home and I, I, I beat the guy to the point of death and his family was going to, to take me and put me in prison. They were, I was up for manslag in poging tot moor, die ouds daarom nie dood nie. And I sat to that, knowing that, remember, I did serve the Lord, I backslided, and I went through this thing where I thought that I was unsaved because of my actions. Here where I'm standing, I don't believe, I believe in eternal security, in the fact that Jesus saved me. I'm not saved by my donkey. I'm not saved by my works. That's what Ephesians says. Ephesians, well, we've got this bottle. If you um, do, do this and you open it up, then it, it um, the Bible says that in Ephesians 1 verse 13, that we were sealed with His promise, Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's your guarantee that you're getting into heaven. Who knows you're only going to heaven because of the Holy Spirit? Okay. So thank God that we can figure that out very early tonight. So I remember um, in 20, uh, 2001, I'm, I, I came to live in a word, not this one, in Pretoria, and I, it was an old, old year eve, it was the year 2000, you, you remember the, the millennial party? Okay, so I was in Hatfield throwing the beer bottles at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and just after that we had to go and fetch my friend's mom from church, and when we got to church they were still be praying. <laughs> we walked in there. And something the Bible says in John 1 verse 5 that the, the, the light came into the darkness and the darkness couldn't overwhelm it. Anyone read that scripture before? I want to tell you the church is too scared of the dark places. For one or another reason we believe that we need to be together as light. Amen. We want to be in, in the nice light places where everyone speaks our language and it's lack of fun. But God didn't call us, even Jesus, the Bible said he left his throne on high and he became nobody and he became mortal flesh and he stayed amongst us and he even became sin. He who knew no sin became sin. He became, literally became sin. Everything that you've done wrong is what he became. Think of your worst moment. And just anticipate that Jesus is, is acting on your behalf, saying, Lord, I'm taking that on me. Can you remember that worst sin that you've done? I remember something that I did and I felt I wanted to vomit. Is there anyone that can relate to that? Imagine that feeling and Jesus saying he, just, he absorbed all our sin on one moment. And um, I remember that evening as I came into church, Neville was standing in front and he made an altar call and I ran to the front. And I just knew I had to get right with Jesus. I wanted to get right with this Lord. Because I heard the, the message of grace and love. And that always draws people into the presence of God. When the Father says, come, my arms is open. 
And sh- sh- shortly thereafter, two days later, I started with Bible college. Day number three, I was drowning the head boy in the fish pond in front of the church. Okay? Um, because he asked me if I was a slave. Back in those days, I had earrings in my ears. And um, apparently, only slaves wore them. So the guy was being sarcastic and asked me if I was a slave. <laughs> I thought to myself, what kind of manners does your father teach you? And I took him to the fish pond, uh, not so politely, but quite casually still. And I had him in the pond, and I was baptizing him for quite severe time, <laughs> period. And they had to come and stop me. Um, are we ready with the multimedia? Okay, if we can't get that, that's fine. I will, I will just do it here from the front then, if you don't get it right. Um, but in 2001, I remember how I went every Sunday. I thought God was a bit bipolar. And then I was saved and then I was unsaved. Because during the week I will miss something and I'll do something wrong. And I'll lose my ability to please God. And I'll feel so unworthy. And then I'll come back on Sunday and I'll give my heart to Jesus. And then I was in the safe camp again. I was doing things right for the next two weeks. And then I missed something again. <laughs> and then, so I had this bipolar Christianity. Saved, unsaved, saved, unsaved, saved. And then I realized one thing. Jesus had to fix this thing in my heart. Because I, I've, I know people that 70 years old. And they stri- they're still trying to get God's affection. And try and please God. And think that there's anything that they can do impressing so going into Bible college I remember one of the prophetic words we got was that we were going to pray for the dead and the dead was going to rise so I took I took every prophetic word very very earnestly with a real sincere heart and I also believe that if God calls you to something I didn't know that it was going to happen in only 20 years from there that my character would be at a place only then where I could maintain it I want to tell you um, driving here, I said to Eddie, there's many people that can get a billion, but the question is if a person's character could can contain a billion. Yeah. You know, we, we, everyone, if I can ask here tonight, who would like to have Elon, Elon Musk's fortune? Everyone would say, yes, we want it. And if I have to tell you that your character might just walk out on you and you might sell out on everything that you believe, will you still be willing to take it? Because there's no money in the world that can buy what we have. And I remember as we got saved, as, as, as I started this journey with the Lord, I got this word, there's going to be a day that you're going to lay your hand on the dead and they're going to rise. So we started, we planted a church um, in Bronkospreit, I think, Linda, you had once in 2012, in 20, no, 2010, you were some of the first guys, it was 2010 or 2011, I'm not sure. But um, we planted the church in Bronkospreit, and being a very young, eager pastor at that stage, I got a phone call from, from a Tani Frida who was in the community. And she phoned me and she said to me, listen here, my husband just fell dead right next to me in the kitchen. And I felt it was my pastoral um, duty to, to get there, make sure that I get there and pray for the dead because I've got this prophetic word. And the dead is waiting to rise. So we're going to get into the car, we're going to go and pray for the dead. And I phoned Linda and I said, listen, yeah, Linda, my wife, my, my wife still, my older son back then was six and I think the middle one was four or three. And I think she, Benjamin was a tiny baby. He was just born. And um, I said to my, to my wife, you get into the car and you go home. I don't want them to see this dead uncle who we're going to pray for now. But um, Linda will come and pick me up and I was, oh, she dropped me at Linda's house and now myself and Linda, we're in the car. We're driving to Tani Frida's house because we've got a mandate to go and pray for the dead. As we got there, yes, sits Dr. Esther Eisen, and he's just written out the death certificate for this guy. I said to him, whoa, 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 please don't sign that thing off. Um, you don't understand. We've got a word from God. We want to pray for the dead. <laughs> and this doctor is a part of the um, Nederdijks Gereformeerde Church, the NG Church. And he's like, who is this little arrogant guy? And I said to him, no, no, doctor, I'm serious. Just wait, stand, stand by. We're going to pray for him. And Linda, we were praying for that guy. Two hours, three hours. He became blue. He, be- he became stiff. And um, I, I went home that night very discouraged. And I thought to myself, the Bible says in Numbers 23 that God's not a man that he should lie. Or the son of man, that he should say something and he would not do it. And I went back home and I was, I was discouraged and disappointed because God 
did not do things in the way that I wanted him to do it. He did not fit into my frame and into my expectation. And I wanted him to do such great miracles. I mean, if he said he's going to raise the dead, I expected him to pitch up when we at least lay our hands on the dead. And ever since I tried to, to break that disappointment in my heart, so I would go and pray for, the, if you can ask Eddie and Linda, every time we had someone dying in the congregation, I was praying for the dead. And from time to time, because people heard that I was praying for the dead, the, 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 the funeral guy, um, I can't remember his name, um, Paul, would phone me. And he would just say to me, listen, Matthias, here's a family, and they are real believers, and th they are wondering, would you please come and pray for the dead? And the last person I prayed for was last year, two years ago, was with COVID, was my friend Peter. Peter just turned 70, or he would have turned 70, is my, was my, one of my best friends, um, a very good co-friend of mine. And um, unfortunately, again, I didn't see the dead rise. So I don't believe that any one of us in here, I believe that gifts, the, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, Spirit will distribute the gifts as it is needed and only if god sees it needed he's going to let you pray for the sick and i can tell you you don't need to know all the bible verses even to raise the dead um the day when it happened with us with michaela i was not that spiritual um i was i was feeling a certain obligation but l let's get into the story irrelevant if the if the slides is ready or not um so myself and carly um ha has a ever deep full thankfulness towards everyone especially I know Eddie and Linda was behind us all the way praying for us and um, I understood that, that many of the people, the congregants were praying for us over, over COVID just the first week in co in co into COVID. I think the, the lockdown started on the 27th of March uh, 2020 and on the 2nd of April, literally a week later, um, we were busy. I was having a conference with some Indian pastors. I walk a road with, um, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual son of Reinhardt, or was a spiritual son of Reinhardt Bonke, and um, I'm on a, a pastor's fraternal where we, we reach out to one another. And I was ministering to, on, on, a, on a fraternal day in India where we had 70, 80 churches that's related to, to, to us. And um, I had this deep sense of, I can't just sit. Um, I, I told my wife that very first day when COVID, because the, 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 on the 26th of March, we were brying with the neighbors, and the 27th, everyone was locked in the houses, and they greeted me from like two miles away. And they were like, <laughs> you know, we, we, this one, we're not going to break this law. I said, but we were just brying yesterday. And they but no, Matthias, you're supposed to keep the law. And I, I, I really want to be a, a law-abiding citizen. I just don't get me in the place where I really get to keep the law all the time. And especially not if God says and um, so I, told, I came back home, I said to my wife, listen, I said, oh, I'm not going to fall into this thing. I, the first person I've got in church that's calling with a need, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to go and pray for them. And she's like, are you crazy? We've just adopted a little girl, she's, she's 18 months, and you want to go and pray for, for, for these COVID people? I said, yes. And she said to me, listen, yeah, then you're on your own. You get undressed in the, in the um, garage. You sp sanitize yourself before you come into the house. And, um, and I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. I can, see, I can interpret when you're going to have marriage problems. Okay? <laughs> I was interpreting such type of problems on their way. And um, uh, again, we, um, we had this uh, the situation where we we had people that that, that were saying listen we are feeling sick and i said to her, listen i need to go i need I, I believe if god sends us i want to tell you you can't die before your time even if you try to yeah. if the devil could have killed anyone in here you would have been dead yeah. it's not in his ability to kill you the only way that you can kill yourself is when you decide because god will never over overrule um, free will and election but otherwise than that, the devil can't kill you. So I look forward for the church to move into a bold, zealous place where we are willing to say, Lord, we're going to put ourselves out there. I want to tell you, we, we can pitch up at any, at any rally. Um, were you with us, Eddie, when we drove down to Uncle Angus? And they had the riot next to the road, and I went and said to the guys, they must stop and let us through. Okay, so these guys are burning tires there at Moe Moe Refi. And I'm like, oh, guys, we're going to get out there. Are you guys right for me? Amper. And um, 
I said to them, listen here, now we have to drive two hours to go around this. Guys, that's not the gospel. The gospel is either you're going to get the hiding, or you're going to go and proclaim the Jesus Christ. I mean, at least the best of it must come that we're going to... So I got out of my Bible. I told them, listen, you're on our way to, to Uncle Angus, and they're like, Uncle who? And, um, and we told them to open up, and we drove through. And we went. I mean, it's a great. Is it a It was a rainy day. And um, so... In my belief system, I really believe that God wants to do a supernatural thing. And I'm also challenging the, the church in a, in a time. The word that I have for this year and what we are doing at Acts 29, uh, we were always a living word as well. We recently changed names two years ago, not because of offense. Um, I know you're not part of the bigger Leaven of Word group, but um, I don't believe in changing your name and doing exactly the same thing. That means you're offended. Okay, so we had to go and sit and say, Lord, you are calling us to change our name. Why? And the Lord said to us, be the next chapter. And I don't think that any way, I don't think Acts is going to get a 29th chapter. I just believe that the church still needs to continue. And as we entered into this year, and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach this year? And ever since this year started, I couldn't, I, the main theme that I'm talking about is roll up your sleeves. I believe it's the time of the church, it's the greatest time. When everything is dark, the guy with the, the, the smallest light can make a very huge impact just by being willing and obedient to say, Lord, here I am. Now, by show of hands tonight, who's against abortions? Is there anyone who's against abortions? That's what we usually get. You're supposed to lift your hands now. It's very right to lift your hand at that, this point. So I was also one of those guys, and I, sat and I, I preached, and I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm against, against abortions. And guess what then, what the Lord told me? He told me to adopt a baby. <laughs> and I said to the Lord, why? Why should we do something like that? And the, the thing that the Lord laid on our hearts is he said, you can't say you're against something, but you don't stand for the opposite. We are silent in our actions. And the church wants us, God wants us, if, if Sarah can trust God on a hundred to reproduce and bring forth a child, we cannot say we're too old. I want granny standing up and saying, listen, we want to adopt people. We want to take people from the streets. We want to fight crime in our country. I want to tell you, if granny speech up at the Judas Malema march, under the spirit, you're going to see the, the EFF running away. In a thousand directions, I promise you. I'm not being arrogant about it. If you pitch up there in an arrogant way, you're going to get a flip and a big hiding. I can tell you that. But if you pitch up under the spirit of the Lord, because the church is not called to fear, we're, we're called to faith. And this is the time of the church ready to be born. So um, you can't see the pictures. I'm just going to turn this around for anyone who, who might just see. So this was our baby girl. That's where she comes from um, when, when we, we met her. And um, that we, can, can anyone, everyone sing? <laughs> I, I guess if I look at the, the average age of the church, I don't think many of you can see. So let's do the following. Let's do this in faith. Just place your hands on your eyes. Say, Jesus. Thank you for 2020 vision now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The righteous shall live by. I must tell you, I prayed for a lady in Madagascar. I was in an outreach in Madagascar. And I prayed for a lady who um, uh, was, she had katarok. I don't know how to do that in English. Cataracts. Cataracts. Okay, please interpret that for someone at the back. Um, she had those things on her eyes. And I said to you, listen here, um, I'm going to pray for her, but I didn't have faith. I promise you, I was going to pray for her because I'm the pastor now and I have to pray for her. I didn't expect anything was going to happen. And the next moment when I, when I, when I took my hands off her eyes, she could see. And I could see the color of her eyes. I get my... In my car, I can't even fluk, but I don't know if I can I get my gat afgeskryk. I nearly ran. I, I told you, I nearly ran on water like Peter. I thought to myself, how the heck does this happen? And as I took my hands off, and then she could read the clock at the back of the church. I can't even read your clock here. And that church was a bit longer. And um, she was reading the clock at the back of the church. <laughs> so, so I really believe that God does healing and he does this. So when we got M Michaela, um, we, we, we got her at three months old. Um, she was very dirty. Uh, I remember when, when I saw her, I, I just thought to myself that this is the girl that the Lord has placed in our hearts. I always wanted to adopt it. On 18 years old, my, my girlfriend went for an abortion. And I said to the Lord, Lord, if there's any way that I could make amends ever for what we've done and the, the wrongs that we've done in the past, I would love to do it. 
And um, we took that baby girl. My, my wife was, didn't want children at first, and um, she accidentally fell pregnant by natural birth control. And um, that's when you do things on a natural way. Um, and we had our eldest son, Aiden, and then she fell in love with him, and she couldn't think that she could love anyone else. And then we had our second boy, Joshua, and then we had our third boy, Benjamin, and then I saw this is becoming a habit now. <laughs> Somewhere it needs to stop. And um, that was just after 2008, 2011, we, we lost everything, and then the Lord told us to plant a church. We were bankrupt, and he told me to plant a church. And... Um, I remember going full time into ministry, it was going well with my finances and as soon as I did what the Lord told me to do, everything came to an end. Is there anyone who's gone through something like that? You do exactly what God tells you to do and the next moment you're saying, Lord, is this me or is this you? And um, I remember my wife in those days, we will sit in the house and um, she'll tell me, listen, we've just eaten our last meat tonight. And someone will come, uh, there's a guy, Yosef, so by the way, he came to us, he, he bought three sheep. And actually five sheep, and he thought he had enough freezing place for it, and um, he realized that he only had place for two of the sheep. And so he came to my house and said, listen, yeah, I'm going to give this to the, to the maid. If you don't care, would, would you, do you, you, you guys, do you have place to accommodate the sheep or two or three, maybe? I was, Carly, it was plek in the freeze You know, um, I was proud. I was very proud. And she said to me, let me go and look. And then she went, you can see the white on every side. It's white as rice. I mean, there's nothing inside. And um, as she took the, she said, yes, I think we, we do have some space. And then the guy came and he brought us sheep. And we were eating sheep for, for, for the next three months. Sheep every evening was awesome. So I made an arrangement with the Lord. If I one day get to heaven and um, the Lamb of God is then, we don't have sheep on the menu. He'll get me hanging on his, on his butt, actually. I can't find a boat from his car. So I'm going to hang on the lamb's butt. <laughs> just, just eat that. Okay, so um, I remember when we um, got Michaela, when I saw her father was about to, to kill her with a hammer. And I usually get called out when they have domestic problems in town um, with families. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the youngest pastor in Bronkospreit. Most of the guys are nearly the average age in here. And also when we get um, drug-related problems, they, they call me to go and handle situations with God. I think, Eddie, you were with me in a, on our very first time that we did a house, um, uh, a house counseling with a guy who beat at his wife. <laughs> and I told him he must, keep my, he must hold my rings. And um, so things are different in Broncos Pratt than here in Eiserfontein. I can promise you that. Don't worry if you beat your wife, you can find these pastors. They're coming, they're going to come and pray for you. I, I don't do praying there. Okay, I'm going to pray for you, but afterwards we're going we're to have a chat. <laughs> okay, so um, when we got to, to the, the parents' house, we had this, I saw this beautiful little baby girl sitting on the father's lap. And he, he had her placed on the table and he wanted to hit her on the head with the hammer. And he said, no one's removing my girl. And unfortunately of the CMR, because both the parents were using drugs, they did remove the child. Um, I took the child, I had a chat with the dad, and um, Michaela were placed in our, in our care. But my wife, when my wife, when I, we, I walked out of the baby, and she took the baby, I thought to myself, this baby looks exactly like my wife. And I thought, but I know she's not open for, for adoption. It's, it's in my heart, and I don't force my opinion on, on anyone else, not even in my house. So if we differ, we come, the Bible says, how will two, two, um, how will two walk together and they stay agree? So we need to come into agreement. In church, we need to come into agreement. It's fine that we have different views, but we need to agree what is the way forward. And as we sat, um, I remember my wife was just there and um, she thought to herself, yes, but this baby really looks like me. And then we ended up, next slide, thank you. Um, so that's my whole family, or part of the family. I'm not in that photo, otherwise the photo was too small. Um, that's after lunch. Um, and so th the, the place where, where Michaela's mom resided is on the next slide. Um, okay, so here we go work. So on the next slide, um, that's the place where, where, where her mom resides. And um, we had this deep call for this baby and 
the very first day that we took her in, we had this prophetic promise of the Lord that we, we're going to have this girl. And um, everyone just came prophetically and said, listen, this girl is for you. And I remembered asking the Lord one thing when I went into ministry. I said, Lord, you can take everything. You can take my houses. You can take my car. You can take everything. But preserve my family. And this was a very huge deal for me because um, I'm, a, I'm a big family guy. And um, I believe that the Lord wants to do something new in our time. I still have an expectation for the Spirit of God to move in our day. Amen. The thing that I see in church is that there seems to be a greater faith for the return of Christ than for the power of the gospel. You can go to the next slide as well. Um, uh, there seems to be a greater, a greater faith for the return of Christ than in the power of the gospel. Guys, the power of the gospel, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ who died. He's resurrected. He's sitting right next to the Father. He's given all authority for the church to stand up, to rise, and to be his hand and his feet. And he's taken away every excuse that we could ever have to become the doormat. He's empowered us to a way that he really called us in a way to, to go. And I believe that Jesus wants the church to go and fix things. You know, the, the, the church, um, we've, we want Jesus to come back and fix things. I don't believe he's coming back until we are willing to fix things first. The church is not, does not need to wait for Jesus to fix things. We need to stand up and get proactive. And we need to be imitating Jesus in that certain sense. In Matthew 6.10 it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is on heaven. On earth, yeah, as it is in heaven. And I believe that there's a greater expectation for God to be on earth and manifested on earth while we are here than for him to get us into heaven. If God's greatest desire was to get you into heaven, he would have just taken you to heaven when you gave your heart to him. His heart is not to get you in heaven and all the churches that I get to be, everyone wants to go to heaven. I don't want to go to heaven. I do want to get to heaven eventually, but I want to first be making a mock on earth. And I want to make, and I want to be the difference that I really believe that God has called us to be. So listen here, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1 says, And when I came to you, brothers, did I come in proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech of wisdom? For I decided to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And guys, this is Paul, the great, the great writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. He says, I didn't come to come and give you an impressive speech about Jesus. I came to you in demonstration. I want you to stand up and have an expectation, expectation to say, Here am I, Lord, use me. Remember the prophet Isaiah when he said, Lord, here am I, use me. And the next moment he realized his lips is, is, is not pure. And what I believe is, is that God is calling some, someone to say, Lord, here am I, take me, use me. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. This is Paul. He's admitting that he was also scared. And it was fearful. I want to tell you, being adrift a night and a day at sea, only holding on to a plank, does not make you comfortable. It does not make you, by, by, by default, want to sing a hymn. It doesn't bring you to that place where you want to stand up and say, Praise God on this spot. Okay, the year is good and the devil is fail good. We've, we've become very good in church slang. And I don't have a problem that we do have that. I don't just have a problem if we don't see any of the owl, every other thing that we should see. And listen, and my speech and in my message were not wrote, wrote, wrote in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So the words that, I, that what I'm writing about, this is what I'm telling you about tonight, is not something that I'm telling you about of how awesome I am. It's not anything I can tell you on my best day. When I was there with Linda, really full of faith, praying for that uncle on the kitchen floor and told the doctor, please don't write his death certificate. Nothing happened. Freshman, Bible school, if there was any good time where God could have used me, you know what God did? He brought me to that point where I knew that it wasn't me doing it. And then when you get to that point where you know it's not about you, it's all for him, to him and about him. It's for his glory. He will do something that will put your mind out there and say, just Lord, you're so awesome. And then he'll ask you, where, where Angus is at? I, I remember when, back in the days um, when Angus was preaching, he was really, he was in his strength and his power. The Lord should have released that guy when he was 25. You know what was the problem? Angus. 
He had to wait that he's an old man because he's a strong guy. If you know him in the natural, he's a strong guy. He's a physical strong guy. He had to wait to bring him to that point where he could first break his own agenda and will so that he can set him up for the nations, the promise that God has spoken. So that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And tonight, I trust that this testimony that we are sharing is something that you would realize this is much less to do with us than it has with you. This is what happened when we saw the, this miracle manifest by everything that happened was based on people that prayed. The Bible says that my house, I want to cry when I say this, my house will be a house of prayer. If we have a prayer meeting here tonight, I'm not sure if 20 people will pitch. If I have a, a prayer meeting in Pretoria, I have two or three people pitching. People don't want to pray. Yet Jesus says, my house will be a house of prayer. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect when you are weak. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insult, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Do we have anyone here that's at the age of 70 maybe? Just by raise of hands, 70, hallelujah. Amper 70, 70 amper. Is there anyone close to 80? Yeah. Amper, Amper. Yeah, that's, that, that's, where, that's where Caleb, where Caleb had the request. I want to tell you on 80, you don't necessarily want to take up the islands. You know why, why Caleb asked for it? He was thriving. On the glory of God. He knew that if God granted his petition, that on 80 he was going to give those guys a fight that they've never seen because he knew no one in Israel ever won a fight except God. Think of it. Not through power nor through might, but through my spirit, says the Lord. That guy was thriving on the spirit of God. He was, he was hunger and thirsty for the move of God. So he said, Lord, on 80, I, I want to, to have this petition. We're only two in this age, age group. It was only him and jo uh, uh, Joshua. Only two guys. And he made a petition of God. Joshua was saying, no, Lord, I've had my fights in my inning. I will give me this place quite next to the um, Jordan. I'm happy to stay this side, and it's a nice place, and my children will love this place. You know what Caleb did? Caleb said, not the tiki. I'm going to take that. I, I've heard there's big boys in that other valley. Man. Imagine what God can do with an 80-year-old. That was his petition. And that's what I believe what the, the gospel is all around, all, all about. The, the, the next slide is, um, I, I'm not sure if um, it's going to play on, on your side. Uh, So this is on the 1st of April, we were sending out to, um, I've got a quite old um, congregation in Bronco Spreit as well, um, so on April Fools on lockdown, ons het besluit om op um, Janita Duplessis uh, liekie te gaan dans. <laughs> Was my vraag? <laughs> she's now, oh, she's in there. And um, so we had the, the, the my bola bop, you play nog the most thing. What? Who knows that song? <laughs> my vrouw komt in your moves. <laughs> okay, so we were, we were um, challenging some of our elders to say, listen, yeah, let's just have some fun. Let's make this a, a great time. It's a family time. And at night, on the 1st of April that night, every, as, as every night, my wife would bath our little girl and she would sing her, to her hallelujah. And um, while we, she was singing this song for her, I went and I stood behind them. And now, you know, you're playing daddy. And I'm making funny things at the back and getting her dry. Because to get a, 
18 month baby who just want to roll off the bed and wants to run away or she, she wants to crawl away and she, she's movable now and the problem was when we we got Michaela we, we were in that time where we were busy changing our name and we had a very busy year at the end of that year we were just trying to say Lord we just need to go and take some rest it's been a very rough year came into the next year went into COVID and we thought it was going to be a good time for us to rest um, and guess what? The Lord made us give away. We, we had a, a second congregation that we planted in Whitbank, living in the word Whitbank, and we gave pretty much 99% of our income we gave away um, when we changed our name. That's December or November, just before, before that year. And then we went, um, and God knows all these things. I want to tell you there's nothing in your life that God does not know. He's interpreted all your, your foot faults. He's interpret, interpreted everything that's going to go wrong. But um, as we, 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 we went through, through, through that season, I remember the Lord, we, we've got um, Ark, which is a, a, re, a restoration center, which we have in Reiten now. It was back then in Bronkospreit. And um, we've got this big vision at the church. We just put up a, a million rand transformer. So I've got a transformer hanging there on a pole that cost me 20,000 rand a month. Um, because we want to see, I want to build the church from the bottom side up. I want to trust the Lord to take the prostitutes and the druggies off the street and replace them in church and give them value and, and all these things. And what happened on the 1st of April, as we were singing this song, we never knew that this was going to be the last song that we're going to um, sing to her as a family. The next mo morning, we, we got up very early. If you go to the next slide, um, myself, I was having a worship session, took my guitar, and I was playing guitar. I don't play for people. I only play in the presence of God. The Bible says, make a joyful noise. And I was playing guitar and worshiping, and she was there with me. That is the clothes that she had on when she drowned. And Michaela um, was sitting there with me. Um, this is roughly at 9 o'clock in the morning. And we, we had a time, I went upstairs, I went to preach for these guys in India. My wife was busy preparing food for lunch, and the boys had a break. Benjamin just left, uh, the, the, they, they had their first break because their tutor was giving school at the house. And he left open the, the back door, and this baby started crawling. So when, when COVID came, because the December lockdown, we couldn't get anything from China, all, all these a prophet sailor, it, 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 it fix covers that they have over the pool, not the one that look, looks like netting. Now that gets braced in, 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 in China, and they couldn't send us any stock for our specific pool. And um, so we had chairs trying to block her out and stuff like that, but this specific day, it was a rainy day, all the doors were closed, and um, my youngest boy went out to take the, the dogs out, and when he came in, he, he saw a, a, a crawling on the outside. But he thought to himself it was the dogs. And he came back into the house and he closed the door. And I'm upstairs. My wife is in the, is in the um, kitchen preparing food. And when I came off the, down, down the stairs, now this is basically just past 11 that that happened. I came down from the stairs roughly half past 12. And when I came down the stairs, now if a baby should get wet, she would have cried immediately. She would have made a big noise. I, I'm talking about not falling into the pool, being wet by the rain and stuff like that, and the wind. So it would have been maybe five minutes and she would be crying and stuff like that. So that's why we know that she went directly into the pool. She, there was a small car in the pool, and she went after the car, and she fell in the pool somewhere just after 11. When I came downstairs, I asked my wife, where's Michaela? She says, says, says she's looking at the TV, um, and she said, where's Michaela? And Joshua said, Nia, no. And we knew. And I came da running down the stairs. She came running out of the kitchen. So when he sat on the couch and he looked through the, the dining room table, through the chairs, he saw her dr drifting on top of the water. And um, we went running out. Um, he jumped into the, the pool. He handed it to, to, for, to Carly. And Carly handed it to me. And when, when I took her, she was feeling like a water bag she was full of water we immediately took off her clothes because to get her warmer and um, her honest her anal was already pushed out she was pitch pitch black a blackish blue dark gray the pale color which the bible speaks about when you die she was that color 
And when I took her, I knew that this is an encounter with death. And my wife started crying and my son started crying. And I said to them, keep quiet. Now you pray. You see, the Bible says that life or death lies in the power of the tongue. And those who choose to use it will either have life or death. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise the standard. So there's promises that we have in God's words. There's 33,000 promises, but we don't tend to take them. As she gave it to me, I didn't think I was very spiritual. I knew she was dead. I pressed the water on her stomach and there was water coming out from on top and from the bottom. And um, some of the food that she ate earlier also came out. And um, I, I couldn't place on the table because of the food that was already prepared there. And I ran with her to the garage where I tried and do CPR. I don't know much. Uh, CPR on a big person is easy. Doing it on a baby, you need to, to have uh, actually a type of degree or something like that. You're, the fact that I didn't break her, her ribs because you're under pressure is a miracle. And um, I blew into her, saw she's dead, she's slipping, we can't hold her. And my, my Benjamin ran away, he ran to the neighbors, and both the neighbors that's staying across the road is church, is, is church people from our church. And Niels came running in, and Ruan came running in. Um, he's one of my trustees today. And as we sat there, they st not sat there, we, we prayed. I said, just pray. And everyone was praying. Niels started phoning Netcare, the helicopter services. And um, as we prayed, the next moment she started breathing. And all of a sudden, we had this girl that she's ice cold. She started breathing, but you can see that there's something wrong with her. Her hands is in, um, pointed in, her feet is turned in, um, you could see she had a severe loss of oxygen. And what you see is not necessarily what you should confess. If you confess what you see, you are living in the natural man and in the, with the natural mind. And that you get only trained that when you walk in spiritual warfare, it's not to declare what you see, it's to declare what you know. It's to say something which is not, faith is not declaring the obvious. Faith is to declare what you don't see. And again, I'm not giving myself out as this major um, guy that, that believed and that had, had all this faith. So when the ambulance service arrived roughly 15, 20 minutes later, um, everything feels like hours. It feels like we were living through weeks at that moment. Um, as soon as the ambulance service took over, um, I went outside and I vomited. I just had this, I felt, I didn't, we didn't have lunch. I just felt this very sickening feeling in my body. And I vomited and I came back in. My wife took off some of the clothes and she had her against the chest just to warm her up. And we were praying. So these guys are standing there, the, the girl from the ambulance service, um, Ginaldi is also from our church. And she's praying and the other guy is standing there looking out what's going on. And she's telling him, no, please give me a needle. And we're speaking in tongues. We're praying in the gifts of the Lord. And I believe that when, when two or more come together in five, I believe the, the fact that we were there together declaring the same thing with one desire. I want to tell you, I don't care how big the problem is. I, it's irrelevant what the problem is. I remember, Linda, when you had, you had a cancer um, in 20, what, 15, 14, 15, round about there. She was a mother of young, two young girls. And the Lord said, pray, pray with faith. And I know that God heals cancer, He heals blind eyes, He heals, and He would not pass anyone. If you read the story of Mark 5, He was on His way, and the next moment He, he, he had this totally not so awesome idea. He stopped at a graveyard to have an encounter with a demon possessed man. And in His busy schedule, because he only has three and a half years to establish this great kingdom of God, that, that this empire that needs to take over the earth. He finds it good to go and spend time with a guy in a graveyard who has hurt himself, hated himself, um, damaged himself to the point where, where he, he scared everyone away from him. And yet Jesus still loved him so much. Now that that guy became the first father, one of the first fathers in the church. The early fathers of the church got recorded that he, he became, he had a magnificent, the, the chapter after that where you read where the people get slain out in the streets. 
it is devoted back to him. If you read the, the manuscripts before that, it says that he was the guy that was in that area proclaiming. It's the only guy that Jesus said, go back and tell people. Up until then, he told everyone to keep quiet. He doesn't trust the church people to go and tell because they're going to tell stories and add to it. He trusts the world. I trust the world. I've got a big, I've got a big lust for the world. Jesus had an obsession with the world. And I'm not talking about getting a girl into a brothel. The other night, I went and I took out a girl at 4 o'clock in the morning. She's 19 years old. Four guys wants to stab me. I thought I was going to die. And again, it's not my time. And when I took her out of the, the brothel with these guys, I only knew it's by God's grace. It's by God's grace. She got into my car, I took her back home. I phoned my wife. I said, listen, yeah, you better get down here because this girl's getting undressed. And I'm not going to put myself in a position of a 19-year-old girl and a story. So my wife came down there, put her in the shower, took her clothes off, took everything. As she handed me her clothes around the corner, I could still smell the semen on her clothes. Guys, this is the type of chats that we don't want to have in church. That's the reality that's going on out there. Now, um, we prayed for the next few hours. We had people sending out in intercession. Anton Stalls from Angus Buckham phoned me. He said, I'm praying with you. I had a lot of friends just communicating with the intercession groups. And we got messages all over the world. Canada, Australia. Um, you can call the countries. UK. We had people paying money over from the UK. Um, she's not, she's not on our, on our, was not on our medical aid because she was only in our... our Zij was toch ons, of hij is van veiligheid. Dus, voor, nie, nie vaste keer nie, um, house of safety. And um, so, she was not on the me medical aid. The medical aid doesn't, um, doesn't put people on, on, on the medical aid then. And the short and the long with this story was that at that night, um, we got to us, they took four hours to stabilize her. Um, we had a young boy having a dream, saying, listen, yeah, she's going to keep one scar back. She only has a scar on her nose from where the, they put the pipe in. They drilled a small hole in her leg to, to put in a binaar, in our bean, in our bean, in our drip, to get a body warm. And as I, I, my wife was on the, on the ambulance, and then she got into the helicopter, but they would not take off until she was stable. So we were already at the hospital an hour and a half later. She's still not stable. So she keeps on dying and then coming back alive and dying, coming back alive. And then she gets this convulsions, which is typically signs of someone that's got a measure of brain damage. And we would not confess any death, but we felt so guilty. I don't know. I remember in 2000 and... Um, I was on my way, Eddie, you were with me again. We were on our way to, uh, um, in Durban, what, who was that guy? He was supposed to preach at our church before he fell in sin. Weet jy van wie ek praat? To my vrou oor my kind gereid. I'm so glad my wife's not, she always gives me the look when I say stuff like that. Um, the guy that, there, there was a revivalist that was in South Africa, I, I think, um, uh, okay, irrelevant, but my wife drove over my, our middle child, where's Joshua, just wife, um, he went and threw a tantrum in the garage because he couldn't open the garage, the, the girl opened the garage door, and he threw a tantrum and he went and lay down in the garage and she couldn't see him, so she drove over him, okay, so... <laughs> And um, so now we, I'm on the airport and she's finding, she said, listen, I just drove over the boy. I said, well, I've got peace, let me pray. And we prayed and we went to the crusade. She found me and she said, listen, there's no scar tissue. There's only scar tissue injury. There's no broken, no damage, no, everything is right. I want to say to you, if you're serving the Lord and you're not on a, under a constant attack, then you must question if you're really proactive. I mean, Paul was being stoned, and he, I'm not talking about being stoned. He was seriously stoned for serving the Lord. Um, so when, when I got to hospital the next moment, the helicopter landed there, and I had a, a, a Hindu doctor addressing me. You know what he told me? He said to me, listen, yeah. He said, Pastor, I want to tell you, your daughter's here, but she's in a very bad condition. And babies this size don't usually make it through. And I was like, I said to him, Doctor, I know what you're saying, but I want to tell you that I serve a Jesus. 
And he said to me, I also believe in your Jesus. I said to him, you will only believe in him if you see what he does. I could not change my confession because my emotions is all over the place. I stood there with a broken heart and I, I observed her and um, I'm going to show you now. This is the second video. Just go to the next slide. There we are praying for her and we are holding her legs. Less than 12 hours later, we didn't know, we didn't know that she was going to be critical, be, be, being dead. And there's just photos, oh, genade. Um, there's photos of how she looked um, in the hospital. Um, and they said to me, listen, uh, she, she's stable in the sense that she's there. But we've got two very big problems. The first problem is that her lungs isn't going to make it. Her lungs was white, white, white. And if you know, if you've got any ma medical background, you, know, you would know that any person's lungs should be on an x-ray, should be black, and any form of white that you see is a problem. So her, her lungs were totally white. And then the second thing was that, that her brain was abnormally, um, there was no br brain function, but yet while we were singing for her, she moved her feet. So the natural man was not there, wasn't present, but in the spirit, she was reacting because her spirit is trained to hear. Now I've got a friend of mine, Isaiah Reed, he, he, he's a pastor's kid, we had him at our church in 2011, he got shot by in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a um, drug deal and um, he got paralyzed and he grabbed the guy's hand and then he, they stabbed him 18 times, threw him out of the car, drove over him, they declared him dead on arrival, took him to the mortuary while they were bu busy doing an autopsy on him. His mom phoned and she said, listen, you put the phone next to his ear. And they said, why? She said, it's my first fruit. I've dedicated him to God. And as she's busy praying for him, the next moment he starts breathing. Now that's, that's the power of God which we serve. So here where you can see she's not stable and they said to us, so we immediately notified everyone and we asked the church, please pray with us. And the first thing that they did, two hours later, they phoned us from the hospitals. They said, listen here, um, they, 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 they're not sure. It looks very, very good. I said, what looks very good? They said, the fact that, that her lungs is clear, they're going to just make sure if the x-ray machine isn't faulty. <laughs> and I'm like, don't worry, the x-ray machine is not faulty. Um, and the, so the next moment, her lungs, because of the prayers of the saints that's going out from everywhere, including Eiserfontein, her, her, her lungs just totally cleared up. And then we still had the issue of the brain. And we said to everyone, well, if God can clear her lungs in two hours, I don't believe God's just going to give us a little bit of a handicap baby back. We, we want to tr trust the Lord for a full miracle. And then we started praying for a brain. And guess what happened? Four days later, doesn't it sound familiar? Has ever read the story of jo John 11 where Jesus was, he was just a little bit late for a friend's sick bed. <laughs> and when he got there, the guy's already in the grave. Now, in this, in this thing from, from literally being dead, no way of her surviving. And I remember driving back that night. I need to set this straight because Benjamin is sit, sitting here. Um, as we drove back that evening, the question was, who's the guilty one? Who's going to take the blame? Who's responsible? I want to tell you, there's that same question pointed to Jesus in the Gospels. They ask, whose fault is it? Is it his parents' fault? Is it his fault that he's blind? And Jesus said, neither. It's for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And I want to say to you tonight, we must even deal with certain blame shifting in our lives. Whose fault is it that we went bankrupt? It's for the glory of God. Whose fault is it that things isn't working out as it should? It's for the glory of God. What's your confession in difficult times? So you know what we did? We went back home. And we are not full of faith. We are crying. We are heartbroken. We, it sounds like if we had faith. I want to tell you, I would fall asleep 
crying. I cry my, my bed and my pillow wet. And I'll wake myself with tears and crying. And then I'll hear my wife crying next to me. And we would feel so guilty. At that night, two o'clock in the morning, I wanted to blow my brains away. I said to myself, I failed as a dad. We had a conversation. You know what she told me? She said, I failed. I should have been with her. I felt so responsible in duties. I wanted to make food and be good. And I failed as a mom. I said, I failed as a dad. I should have got that sale when we got the baby. I'm guilty. You know what? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much guilty you are in the process. God is greater than anything that you have misinterpreted, which you have done wrong, which you have not foreseen. Because we, none of us did it with the intention that we wanted to kill her. And neither did my son Ben. It was an accident which God was using to bring us together, not to destroy us. And here we, we are sitting, many of us has lost loved ones, and we are angry with God because we don't understand the plans of God. As his ways are different than his ways are different than ours, as the east is from the west. And we came back home, and you know what? The Lord gave us wisdom. He said, Tonight you unify your house. Because unless this house is not unified, we will not stand. We came back home and we took communion. We said, listen, and everyone immediately wanted to say, listen, it's this one, this one, this one. I said, stop it. I said, no, we're not going to fight. We're just going to pray. We took the bread, we broke it, and we said, this is his body that's broken for me, Taylor. And we as a family are going to stand in the gap and we're going to trust God for the supernatural. We've already seen him resurrect the dead, but it's not a good story if the person is still brain dead. And I don't want to have a half story. And I want to say to you, don't give on your, up on your dreams. God has promised some of your children, they're going into ministry. He's made promises over your life. Don't settle for the half vision. We tend to settle for half vision. But don't care what your things is. If it's maybe financial, maybe it is emotional, maybe you feel, listen, yeah, I'm, my time is gone. I should have done this. Or I should have completed this at this age. I think, you know, if you look at Facebook, many people feel so insignificant because we compare to others. The most dangerous thing that we have in this time is, is that we are living in a time where information is everywhere. So we get compared to everyone. And in, deep in ourselves, we always think that we are not worthy. We took that communion and we said, listen, yeah, there's no guilt on any one of us. It could have been me, it could have been you, it could have been all of us. Now we stand and we trust the Lord. And we prayed that night. Um, we went through that night and by the Sunday morning, Saturday, the same thing. You've got this ups and downs. When you lose someone, the next moment you're happy and you're full, full of faith. They've thrown me on Saturday evening. I said, are you taking the sermon on Sunday? I said, of course I'm taking the sermon on Sunday. What do you mean am I taking the sermon? I said, I'm about to trust God. Why will I not pitch up? Jesus did not fail to pitch up in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said to his dad, he said, if there's any way you can take it away from me, take it away. But I'm, I'm willing to do whatever this takes. And this is when we roll back our sleeves in this time and say, Lord, I'm not going to have an excuse. I want to be willing. One thing that we don't have these days is time. We don't have time to go and sit with people. We have a lot of time to, to do Facebook and to do all these other non-important essentials, TikTok, all those things. But we don't have time to go and sit with the widow. We don't have time just to go and hear someone's heart, just to go and pick up their story and just, just catch up what's going on in their lives. I want to ask you, when last have you stopped and changed someone's tire? Okay, when I make statements like that, I'm going to get a flat tire when I drive back. Um, okay, so um, I remember the Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, I sent a message to my, my um, second pastor, and I said to him, listen, Armand, you're going to have to take this service. I'm not capable. I don't feel emotionally right. I don't feel, I don't feel like a legend. I don't feel that I've, I've got the ability. And as things are, day three, day four is a, very, is a mitigating factor. In the medical world, they'll tell you day three or four is always a place where you either lose or you gain. And um, this, I, I left him a message and he replied back, he's it's ready to take it. And that morning when I got up, I was up at just before five. I said to my wife, I just feel the Lord says I must take the sermon. I don't want to preach. 
But I never desire, I, I, I have nothing to say. But I feel, let's just do it. And I went and I preached the message. Um, and while I was busy preaching, the, the doctor phoned. My, my wife walked out. She said, listen, yeah, I just want to give you feedback. We're going to excubate your child today. She's, there's no brain damage. There's nothing on the lungs. There's no sign that she even drowned. If we didn't see her beforehand, yeah, let's give it a hand. Um, um, if we didn't see her beforehand, you can just go to the next slide there. Um, so that, that's the only thing that she still had in when we went and fetched her. That's the night when she slept, the, the, came back home. They wouldn't give her back to us because she's uh, uh, in, our, in, our, in our house of safety. They said that they st first have to lodge an investigation to determine if we were negligent. And um, when, when the, the CMR lady phoned me, I had a message from Angus that told me, listen, yeah, you don't speak to the press about anything now. You don't give any information to anyone. And I followed his, uh, his advice. And so when she phoned me, I said to Lysenia, I'm, I'm not going to speak to you. I've got the CMR that I'm negotiating on. I don't know. I can't confirm who she is. So she thought I was a bit of a racist, not understanding that I'm colored. Um, and um, when I phoned her the mo Monday morning, we had to make an appointment with her. And we went and sat with her. And we were sharing this message with her, and she was crying. And she placed the child back in our care with the highest recommendation. And um, that, again, is just a miracle. So um, I quickly want to show you just, this is the next morning when we woke up in our house. Um, sorry that the videos isn't working on your system. So yes, she's sitting on our, on our um, lounge floor and she's worshipping God, she's lifting her hands, clapping her hands, doing everything what she did, all the milestones that she did before she drowned. And I went and I said to the Lord in that afternoon, I said, Lord, why did this happen? Because remember what I told you in the beginning, I asked the Lord one thing. I've only asked him for one thing, to preserve my family. And you know what he said to me? He said, unless... A seed falls into the ground and it dies. It can't bring forth life. And she was, she's by default, she's got another man's um, DNA. I, I earnestly believe when you have to go and test it today, that you'll find that I didn't go around sleeping with the truck prostitutes in Bronkospreit. <coughs> but I'm sure that she's got my DNA. Amen. Okay. So that very night when she drowned, when she came back home, my wife, when she gets cold, will maybe pick her up tonight. Her lips becomes purple. She was sweating every night. We had to change her clothes three, four times every night. And all of a sudden, we, we had this baby that is all of a sudden getting cold. Her lips is turning purple like my wife. Um, I think that, and I said to the Lord, why is that? He said, in a marriage, when a husband dies or a wife dies, he cancels the contract that was before it. And I said, Lord, but what does it have to do with me? He said, I just canceled her contract with her parents. We've never had contact with her parents again. She's legally adopted. She's ours. I believe she has our DNA. So it's Biggie Stouter is my normal kinder. But apparently it's a girl thing, and I think she's got us all a bit twisted around her pinky. Um, you can just go to the next slide. Uh, so there the next day we were just having communion. I believe that communion really does something. We, we take it for granted. I want to say to you tonight, whenever you use communion, it is the Lord's body and it is his blood. And he tells us to use it as regularly as we can. Now, the story of Michaela was just the, the, the thing that I believe that the Lord just wanted us to get our foot into churches and to speak to people is... It's not, I don't believe it's something that we need to speak about in 20 years' time. And 30 years, it should not be the main thing on our lips. Um, I, I believe that, that every week should be a new testimony. And that's what the Lord did with our, with, with our lives. The, the, the place where I come out of placed me into a destiny 
where we, we met up with this beautiful young girl and I totally fell in love with her. And she, she had my heart from day one. I remember taking her into my arms and listening to Stephen, Stephen Curtis Chapman um, where he sings a song of Cinderella. I don't know if you've ever heard that song. Okay, and I had my first dance with her when she was three months old, the very day she entered my house. It's my first time I had a dance with my girl. And I believe I'll be the man dancing with her on a wedding. I've got a okay, preferred visa visi, there where there's no constant prophetic vision, my people perish. So I don't want to become one of the guys that wants to become 140 years old. I don't have a desire for that. I don't want people to feel sorry for me when I sit at the beach. Um, I want to be proactive. I want to be like the Caleb of my time. And when my time is finished, I need to go. I want to go. I believe in heaven. Amen. So um, please go to the next slide. Uh, what the Lord spoke to us then was, I, I grew a heart for the broken because I believe that this is what the church is called for. I believe that we are a light in a dark place. I believe we are the salt of the world. I believe that we, we, should, we should change people's lives. And this is Piet. He's a, he's a church member of mine. This is his daughter. That's his daughter six months later after being on Crystal Myth and being through the Nigerians. I placed a lot of photos not on the screen um, just because of our sensitivities. Um, he's one of the guys that's come behind me in, in my endeavor to fight crime and fight, fight injustice in our time. Um, anyone who knows me will tell you I've, I've got a lot of black boys and colored. I've got from Kimberley's world. I have a clump of sins of Percy. I say from Percy, so I can very good speak my fluke. I say from Percy, all colors can so good speak as what you can fluke. So I have a I have a role with white guys, black guys, colored guys. I've made myself colored so that no one can call me a racist. Um, I'm politically correct. I think I might get some free ground one of these days. Um, for whatever that is worth. <laughs> um, but we have gone on this route where we started with a Rise Restoration Center back in 2016 already, where um, I want to just share a bit. The Lord spoke to me and he said to me, after a friend of my, mine, one of our church congregants' sons passed away on a heroin um, overdose, and he said to me, you, you want to, I've called you to do something, and I've brought you out of a background, but you have not done anything for me in that area. You are sitting with church people. You are having coffee. You are eating cake. I was a good pastor. Linda, this is a good pastor. When they just met me, I was an evangelist. I wasn't much of a pastor, but I, 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 I think I grew into that. And um, all of a sudden, I, I had the Lord telling me, listen, Matthias, you are growing. You are smelling to religious. I don't know if you guys have ever, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, I can smell religion like a very far, <laughs> far, far away. I, I, as a guy, as a guy, and it's not, I don't have anything against religion. I just, I, I just don't think that you should come into a place where it should be, a, it should be a relationship always and not as much a, a ritual. And God does not take the light in the rituals that we bring him. I want to tell you, if your offering or your tithe is burdensome, keep it. Go buy, go buy brandy. Okay, it's also good. Okay, if you're tired, and people don't like speaking about these things, because the Bible says that God takes delight in a cheerful giver. Okay, and the, while I have the liberty, I just speak freely as, uh, if I'm busy, as I give you a friend, then please take your hand up. Then you have my mic not off. And then I'm going to talk. But when I, when I met Piet, and I saw this, I said to him, Piet, come on, let's, let's do this thing. And, I remember from time to time where, where we have to go. This is a guy that, the next slide is a, a guy that came into Ark. He was one of those guys standing at the robot doing this. And then he wants your, your garbage. And that's him on the second photo. His wife is now pregnant. Um, they've, they've got a beautiful young girl. He's got a business in, in Whitbank as well, Eddie. And um, they're doing very, very well, and God has graciously just, just placed him. It's like Casper's daughter dies, by the way. Yeah. Okay, so I give him some big money, and it's not even trout. Okay. So, um, but what, what a great, what a great guy. You can just go on to the next slide. I'm just giving a few, just want to give a few examples of what we are doing. Um, these are four of the goals that's on my program. Um, 
Tuanai was left in, in a location uh, where in a squatter camp when she was three months old. Her father rejected her. She's got a lot of daddy issues. That's the girl I went and fetched at 4 o'clock in the morning and took back home. The other one next to her, his name is Ab Abigail. Abby comes out of a sexual... Um, she's, she's generally confused at this stage, or was generally confused, and God's just doing a miracle in her heart. Um, the other one is Ketlehu. Ketlehu was this hardcore colored girl that was angry at life. Today she's the most gentle girl that you can speak to. I trust her. She, she's looking after our children. And um, she's, she's so lovely in all, all ways. Natasha um, is up for court. Um, she killed her husband on um, the 14th of February a year ago where he used to come back after taking drugs. The both of them took drugs and he'll kick her. And he kicked her to the point where her, her women parts could not be recognized. It's, it's, she was so badly bruised that the, the, the doctor said to her that she'll never be able to function normally as a woman again because of the, the, the fractures and the things that she went through. And um, this is a girl with the name of Lazan. When she came in, she was a high-end prostitute working for 3,600 rand an hour. Um, you can just go up a bit. Um, and she ended up working for a fix, 30 rand. That's a bag of... Um, cheap, cheap heroin, um, and that they threw her with some hot water. So when she came to us, you can't really see it on this picture, but the wound on this foot, they wanted to amputate the leg. And when we, we, what what helped her with the leg was the fact that she was using drugs. That was a misspike from the drugs, and. Um, they, they would have amputated a leg and then we partnered with some hospitals that's giving us every week we are, we are putting a plaster on our feet that's roughly costing us four and a half thousand rand for a plaster. And um, we got sponsored. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. By, the, um, by, by doctors who would just come on board and say, listen, yeah, we feel that the Lord is leading us to pay for this. Um, today, Lizanne, um, I didn't place a photo in here. They sent it for me too late. She's such a great leader. Um, she's one of my tutors. Who's tutor is she? Joshua. She's, 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 she's Joshua's tutor. Um, she's a, um, uh, yes, what do you mean? Is it a, a bio? <laughs> yeah. Um, she had for long set gewerk. She had in the laboratorium gewerk. In, um, she's a very clever girl. And, um, yeah. The girl here at the bottom, Janine, she didn't make it, unfortunately. Sorry for the breast. I know this is church, but this is the reality. Um, uh, she, she passed away, and in our endeavor to try and help her, um, we could not. We could not. It was just beyond what we could ever restore and repair. Eddie is, was 65 kilograms when he got to us. One of the most arrogant, arrogant manipulative persons that I've ever met in my life. And I was driving there one night with one of my church congregants and I was going to give him a very big beating because of the way that he treats people, he's disrespectful, he's, he's, he's angry at life and he's got daddy issues and he wants to keep everyone accountable for what went wrong in his life but he doesn't want to take responsible for, responsibility for everything, anything that he does. And I was about to give him a very big hiding and the Lord came down on that man like fire. Today he's one of my strongest leaders. He's running, he's the second in charge of the camp. The guy running the camp at this stage, his name is Yanni. Yanni got um, into the ministry literally a year and a half ago. Um, his wife told me she never wants to speak to him again. He was, um, when we got to the police station to try to get his, his, his record, he had like 24 criminal cases against him. One of the cases that was standing was assault GHB which was against him for beating his wife. And he beat his wife to the point where she had a skull fracture. And um, I, phoned, I phoned and I said to him, listen, you've got two baby girls. Your husband has met Jesus. Can we reconcile you guys? And she said to me, there's no way in this lifetime or 20 after this that she'll ever consider coming back to you. And I said to her, that's fine. I understand. But can we have contact with the children? So he had, um, every second week he had uh, a phone call with the children 
and she wasn't supposed to be part of the phone call, but she would obviously, um, that's him phoning me, um, he would, she would listen in while he's busy speaking to the children, and then she'll rudely interrupt him, <coughs> and then just, just curse at him, and then she'll switch off the phone, and I'll phone her back, and I'll counsel say, listen here, Darren, that wasn't the agreement. Remember we said we don't want your daughters to grow up without a dad, and he has changed. And as we started building relationship, the next moment she got right. And guess what? A year later, she's on the program. Last year, October, she joined her husband with her two daughters. They're running the program for me in Pretoria. Um, and the, the, the two of them are so happily working for the Lord. Um, and even up, I mean, now again, you, we should think that they should be angels. I mean, kerk mense beklein moest nie. Jylle beklein nie. Jylle, jylle, jylle praat getus uit onder die Bijbel. Op een mooie manier. Okay, so every now and then they do have arguments and they flare up the whole camp. Everyone hears that there's an argument, but he doesn't beat anymore. I think that's a huge step. And you know what's busy happening is I'm seeing people that's got the ability to change and people that's willing to say, Lord, I want to do something. I, wanna, I believe that God's still the God who calls the worst of the worst and he restores them. In John 4, Jesus was having a, a communication with a girl that was sitting at a pit. And while he was talking to this girl, all the disciples came back and they thought to themselves, yes, like, why does this guy always put us in this position? He's so, he's so controversial, he should know most now, this is the type of girl that comes out and freaking hell, well, come on Jesus. And guess what, the next moment she, she, she gets up and she runs into town and down, no one is willing to ask any questions because they know what, he knows what they are thinking, but I mean, it doesn't matter. And the next moment she comes back with the whole town. And now they are staying three days. We don't preach about those things. They speak, st staying three down days in the Cape Flats. After this girl goes back, I, want, I don't want to go and save the, the biggest gangster. I want to have an encounter with the girl, a colored girl at the Cape Flats that's going to lead all those guys to Jesus. I want to tell you, you need to, we need to trust the Lord for the greatest encounters. The greatest encounters of our time are still yet to come. And God's going to use people that's willing to say, Lord, I am ready and I want to be used. And he's going to say, listen, yeah, I've placed my, my spirit upon you and I've called you without any excuse in this time to stand up. You know, when, um, every now and then I'll have this thing, um, especially with new clients that I'll have, I, I call it this Julius Malema spirit, um, where we, we have this whole thing that I'm a racist because... Uh, I'm addressing certain things in people's life and culturally it's unacceptable. I believe we should stop trying to be culturally correct. We are too culturally sensitive in church. We are too, 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 too sensitive to speak about homosexuality. We're too sensitive to speak about, about sin. We're too sensitive to speak about a fornication of adultery. I'm telling my boys, listen here, yeah, stop it while you're young. Um, we don't give the young people education on what routes to go and what to follow and what to do when you get to a place where you are tempted to the point where you feel you can ruin your own life. And out of a practical point of view, is that's what ARC is all about. It's transforming lives, it's restoring families, and it's impacting the community. And the only way that we believe we can do it is I'm taking people literally out of brothels, from the streets, and I'm saying, Lord, I believe that there's a call upon their life. And if they can find it, if they have money or not, to surrender into your call, and you can use them, then we've got the mightiest army on earth. Because the only difference between them and good church people is the fact that they're not scared of dying because they should have been dead. So I've got an army of guys that says, Lord, if I'm telling them, listen, yeah, we're going to a brothel now, and we're going to take girls out, or we're going to this drug house, I tell you, I don't have a problem to get people to go with me. If I find the church, people know, I'm at my family, I'm here, I won't be able, sorry, it's, my wife feels uncomfortable with the fact that I might lose my life. Well, you're going to lose your life in any case. Just get in the bus. I need, I need backup. Jesus also wanted backup. Guess how many church people stayed for his backup? Only the one that was called the Beloved. It's only one guy that stays. It's, not, it's only the ones that love, that always stay. I want to tell you, if you want to fight with me, you're going to have to go through that colored girl inside there. Um, because she loves me. If I touch something you love, you've got to fight. 
And I want to tell you tonight, if anyone touches you, and he's so totally in love with you, as I am with that little girl, I want to say to you, they've got a problem. Okay, so let's wrap this thing up. I just want to show you two more slides. Just go to the next slide. Wesley is, um, when he came in there, I said to him, I didn't know if he was a man or a woman, so I was unsure where to place him. And I had to go to the bathroom to make sure he's not lying. Because how do you know a person on drugs is lying? He opens his mouth. Okay, so, and so afterwards I said to him, well, congratulations, we're really relational because we just configured that you are a man. Okay, based on his gender. And um, so Wesley today is, is, one of, is one of the guys with the most upright spirits. He's, he's so godly, so loving, so kind. He's the most kindest person that I've ever met in my life. Um, the guy, just the, the last guy I'm going to show you, his name is Anton. And Anton is, um, today he's running my building team. We are, we are currently, when we started off with ARC, I had three guys staying in my house. <laughs> one night I came out of um, my, my room and I caught the one guy peeping in one of my wife's Tupperware bucket. Now, if you say, yeah, okay, you throw a Tupperware box, pipi, that's not a lucky thing. So we had to have a conversation. I had to make a plan to get the guys out of my house. Okay, so then we, we, we rented the house because we were trying to save the Lord some money. I wanted to help the Lord to help me so that I can help people. And, um, and then at the end of the day, we ended up with a small place. It was, we could only accommodate 10 guys and it went very well. We were full, full, full. But um, the word that we had was, we, we should go and do this work. And then I had a good financial board with me. We said, listen here, we can only do it once the finances say that God, if God guides, he provides. So if we see the provision, then we will know it's God's plan. And I was like, but that's not what God is saying to me. God said to me, be the guy at the inn. And um, who's ever read the story of the Good Samaritan? Yeah. So the story goes like this. It's a guy that was um, on his way somewhere and he got overwhelmed by robbers and he got beaten to the point of death. And then a priest and a Levite walked past him and they got all over him and they ignored him. They knew what the problem was. They could see that it was one of their people. They overlooked the problem. They said they were insufficient. They didn't have the capital and they neither had the time. Does it sound like anything that we have in church today? And then the Lord said, then one man came past, and he was using this example to explain who is your neighbor. He said, and one man went past, and this is how a church person should look. He said, when he saw the problem, he owned it. There's a, there's a rule of thumb in, when you work in a, in a corporate environment where they say, if you see the problem, own it. Let's make that thing, let's make, is that, am I right? If you, on the, in the minds, if you see a problem, don't call someone, own it. Do something about it. Can we do that in church as well? Can we make that the rule of the day? If you see a problem, own it. The second thing that, um, that I really believed, um, uh, I don't know where I was going now. Samaritan. Oh, the Good Samaritan, of course. And the, the, he, he saw the problem, he owned the problem, he took the problem, he made it his own, he took it to an inn, he paid for the problem. And I said to the church, I went back and I said to them, listen here guys, I said, and you know what the Lord did? He placed us in COVID so that we didn't have money anymore. So all of a sudden I said to them, well, it's a good time to close church because God's not, God's not providing, so then he's most probably not guiding. And you know what? And then I asked them, can I ask you humbly to allow me to make very bad financial decisions because we, we've got nothing to lose. And so we went and we, we, we came to a campground and we started off with a building that hardly worked because everyone broke out. And we first just had to get the one, our biggest achievement was the fact that we had one dorm working where we can, can keep 10 people inside and they don't run away. And, um, and that was a challenge by itself. And the fact, X factor when it comes to humans. And today we are standing on 90 people on the program where we give 8,100 plates of food every, every month um, and we are busy building the next dorm where we can take in another 48 people 
and a dorm behind it, a smaller dorm which can take another eight people. So we will have another place, 72 places in the next two weeks. Um, we are, we are, what is up here wants to start with it. And I told Eddie the other day, someone sent me a yellow machine. And the yellow machine was, I've never seen God rebuking people for having too much faith. Have you ever seen God rebuking people for having too much faith? Anyone? So we, we got a yellow machine. There's no an excavator and it's breaking the ground and doing everything right. And I said to them, listen, you said all the work that we planned is finished. I said to them, okay, well, so let's do another four dorms. <laughs> and now we're busy plotting out another four dorms and the excavator. When I get back home, there'll be another four dorms lined up. And I had Yanni phoning me and said to me, listen, where do you think you're going to get the money? I said, exactly the same place we've got all the money before. I don't know. It's just going to fall out of the air. And I remember the Lord took me back to Bible college. They asked me, who believes that money grows on trees? And it was a rhetorical question not supposed to be answered. <laughs> and I was the only guy in class with another friend of mine who raised my hand and said, I believe, I mean, I've read a story where Jesus placed money in a fish's mouth. And I raised my hand and the teacher's like, are you serious? That's a childish way of responding. And I'm like, are you serious? I, church, I think tonight, I'm just going to make it simple. If there's any way that we can get some background music, I just want to be faithful. If that's fine, I'm going to take up another five, ten minutes. Um, I would really just like to pray tonight.